Lieutenant General Frank E. Peterson, it's just not going to be that way. Lieutenant General Frank E. Peterson came into the Marine Corps in 1952. He was not the Marine Corps' first black officer, but he did not miss that distinction by much. The first black officer, Frederick Branch, had been commissioned only six years earlier. Peterson, however, was the Marine Corps' first black aviator and its first squadron, group, and wing commander. He was also the first Marine African-American general officer. He retired in 1988 as a lieutenant general in command of the Marine Corps Combat Development Command. In his career, he flew 350 combat missions in two different wars. He was an astute aviation tactician and inspirational leader. When he entered the Marine Corps in 1952, segregation was still legal in America. He entered a Marine Corps that discriminated by policy against blacks and other minorities. He served amongst many Marines who believed that blacks should not be in their corps. In a 1972 oral history interview, then Lieutenant Colonel Peterson describes a racial incident that occurred in 1953 at the El Toro Marine Corps Air Station. Then he describes joining VMF 212, a Marine Corps flying squadron performing combat missions in the Korean War. El Toro was my first duty station prior to going over to Korea, and uh, that started off a little hectically because, uh, of course, there had been no black pilots before, and uh, my first night uh, on the base uh, at the old club, I was challenged by a reserve captain who questioned uh, my authenticity to the point of calling the duty officer down and uh, uh, asking that I be locked up for impersonating an officer in the whole, the whole nine yards. And the following morning I was called in by my commanding officer and questioned uh, uh, why I had started a ruckus in the old club. This gentleman was a reserve lieutenant colonel by the name of Black, I believe, out of Kansas City. And after he had heard the uh, chain of events, uh, my side of the story, uh, he took uh, actions, uh, positive actions on my side. Uh, Kent was also a lawyer. And uh, an apology was rendered. The man who had caused the incident was uh, immediately transferred over to Korea. And uh, it was thought that to publicize my arrival that articles in the base newspaper should be put out so that I would not have any further encounters. And uh, that was uh, a pretty much a low spot for me because I, I uh, had not really had problems while I was going through the uh, cadet system throughout the south, Pensacola, Alabama, and uh, Texas, and then to go to California for my first duty station and run right into it. Uh, that sort of tightened me up a little bit. Well, I would imagine you ran into a good bit of it, uh, certainly, and that, that is in prejudice or latent prejudice because uh, at this time the Marine Corps really had just begun to integrate. And That's true. And, uh, but it's strange the way it worked. Uh, that was the only incident that uh, I encountered uh, up until the point, uh, well, after having gone training at El Toro, then I was transferred over to uh, Korea and joined the squadron there. And uh, there was only one encounter with uh, one individual uh, while in the squadron uh, in Korea, but for the most part, uh, I really didn't have the problems that others would have, and I think perhaps because of the squadron protection, so to speak. In a squadron of about 25 pilots or so and other officers, and it doesn't take long for word to spread who you are and so forth. And uh, uh, most of the guys were pretty straight shooters. I found some of my best supporters were a fellow by the name of Clark from Atlanta, Georgia, as an example, who was in my squadron in Korea, Bill Clark, and uh, several others who uh, just made damn sure that there would be no problems when it was going on. 
captains and majors who were in for their second time around. And uh, they'd seen the ropes and so forth, and most of them were from the South, and they just said, no, it's just not going to be that way. For General Peterson to succeed in this environment required confidence, forgiveness, and a thick hide. But most importantly, it required Peterson to be tactically astute and a competent leader. Although he was a pioneer for racial equality and fairness, he, more than anything else, was a skilled fighter pilot and leader of Marines. Because of these qualities and a merit-based organization, he won the respect and support of Marines of all shades and ranks. Through his career, he witnessed the Marine Corps advance in racial equality through Marine Corps policy, command focus, and training. Peterson was the Marine Corps standard bearer for racial justice and equality. He was a role model for younger black Marines by his exemplary service and overcame preconceived notions about race. This raises the question for today's Marines. How does a command ensure that promotions and job assignments are truly merit-based and not a factor of personal preference, preconceived notions, or stereotyping? With constant social pressure on the Marine Corps to be more inclusive, how should leadership training be adjusted to promote the smooth integration of Marines of varying beliefs and lifestyles to ensure that units are still combat ready? For additional information on Lieutenant General Peterson, and or race relations in the Marine Corps, please read Into the Tiger's Jaw, America's First Black Marine Aviator by Frank E. Peterson, Jr., Blacks in the Marine Corps by Henry I. Shaw and Ralph Donnelly, Pathbreakers by Fred Allison and Colonel Curtis Wheeler, and Pride, Progress, and Prospects by Colonel Alphonse G. Davis.